Welcome, everyone. I'm glad that you are here. This uh, program, we, we bravely captioned Defending the Rights of Children in Military Detention. And in light of the growing awareness of uh, what is happening to Palestinian activists here in the United States, defending Palestinian activists in the United States who are speaking out about events uh, there in Palestine and the occupied territories. Um, before we begin, I will let two of our speakers, Asawa and Gerard, are going to step out early after they have finished speaking. So we're going to have a short question and answer at the end of Sawa's presentation. Short means five minutes. Make sure if you have your questions, write it out, one question per person, and then we're gonna move right into the next part of the program um, so that they can leave and get to their next event on time. Um, with that, um, we all know children occupy a special place in our hearts and minds of people everywhere. And how children are treated, treated is likely to be a matter of concern regardless of what you feel or believe about the Holy Land, uh, Israel, and the occupied territories. So we have asked the co-founders of Military Court Watch here uh, to visit us in Chicago to discuss the Israeli military detention of Palestinian children. Gerard Horton is one of the co-founders. Um, he's a lawyer from Australia, originally doing commercial law. Uh, he's widely recognized now as a leading expert on the treatment of children prosecuted in the Israeli military court system, and he's focused on this issue for over seven years. He's authored a number of reports on the subject for non-governmental organizations for the United Nations and other agencies, and his work has been featured in The Guardian, Huffington Post, 972 Magazine, and the Australian documentary, Stone Cold Justice. Um, prior to co-founding Military Court Watch, Gerard worked for Defense for Children International, which is DCI, and much of his experience and uh, the uh, publications that he produced was during his time with DCI. Prior to his work with DCI, again, he was a practicing member of the Australian Bar. Um, to, his, to his left, <laughs> is Dawa Dubais, Sa I'm sorry, Sawa Dubais, um, who is the second co-founder of Military Court Watch. She's also the head of the International Advocacy Program at the Women's Center for Legal Aid and Counseling. Sawa herself has authored a number of reports that document the effect of the Israeli military occupation on um, the families, particularly mothers uh, of children that are taken into uh, detention. She also was featured in that documentary, Stone Cold Justice. Um, most recently, she co-authored uh, an article with Judy Roth um, that was published in the International Journal of Applied Psychoanalytic Studies. Um, and before joining uh, the Women's Center, she was a partner with the Matten Group, uh, which is a law-based human rights organization which focused on economic rights of Palestinians living under occupation. After Gerard and Sawa speak, we're going to move into the second part of the program with Dima Khalidi. I'll give a special introduction for Dima uh, when she begins. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, tonight, what Sawa and I would like to do is just to give a, a relatively brief thumbnail sketch of um, the military court system. And I think a good place to start is with um, a report published by UNICEF in March of last year, uh, this report, which with the title Children in Israeli Military Detention. And what UNICEF did in preparing that report is they collected over 400 affidavits from children prosecuted in the military courts. And they also spoke with Israeli military officials, uh, civilian authorities, uh, Israeli lawyers, Palestinian lawyers, uh, people associated with the military court system. And they essentially came up with one conclusion. And the conclusion was that ill treatment appears to be widespread, systematic, and institutionalized. And what Sawa and I would like to focus on this evening is that phrase, widespread, systematic, and institutionalized, and essentially try and address the question, why? One place to start, I think, is to just look at um, um, the scale of this issue, 
So according to uh, UN figures, since 1967, something like 750,000 uh, men, women, and children have been prosecuted in this system. It's mostly men. Um, according to the uh, Israeli military authorities, last year, 1,004 children uh, went through the system. Um, the courts have jurisdiction over children as young as 12, but the overwhelming majority of the children who get prosecuted in these military courts are in the 15, 16, 17 year old age bracket. Now, to try and answer the question, why? Why have nearly three quarters of a million people been prosecuted in these military courts since 1967? I think you have to look at the, uh, or answer the question, what is the primary role of the Israeli military in the West Bank? And this is no secret. The military authorities readily acknowledge what their primary role in the West Bank is, and that is to protect the settlements. Uh, according to the latest data, there is something like 582,000 settlers now in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. Tonight, we're just focusing on the West Bank uh, because that is where military law is applied. East Jerusalem, civilian law is applied. So we're just looking at the West Bank. In the West Bank, the numbers are around 382,000 settlers. So essentially, the military has to try and guarantee the protection of those 380,000 civilians in the West Bank. And if you stop and think about it for a moment, that is potentially uh, an extremely difficult task for any military to perform, to have to guarantee the protection of nearly 400,000 civilians in occupied territory. Where I think, and to, to look at it another way, I think it's, it's useful to consider this. Imagine um, if, say, America decided to put 400,000 American civilians into Afghanistan and said, go and build towns and villages, roads, schools, hospitals, shopping malls, etc." cetera. Um, I think it's fair to say there would be a high degree of bloodshed if that were to occur. And I think you would probably find it difficult to, uh, to find any American military commander who would accept that brief. And yet that's what's happened in the West Bank for the last 47 years. Where I think the story gets even more interesting, to my mind anyway, is that according to the US State Department, um, in 2012, no settlers were killed. And when I um, raise this data, I also want to acknowledge that um, I don't mean in any way to trivialize the deaths when they do occur. And of course, particularly in the light of today's events in Jerusalem, uh, where five people uh, were murdered in a synagogue. But I think it is important to look at the objective data. Um, according to the US State Department, in 2012, no settlers were killed in the West Bank. In 2013, two settlers were killed. And this year, so far, five settlers have been killed in the West Bank. And again, not to trivialize those deaths, but it seems to me extraordinary that in three years, with 400,000 civilians living in occupied territory, only seven have been killed. And that strikes me as an extraordinary, uh, an extraordinary achievement by the Israeli military um, to, to essentially protect that number of civilians in occupied territory. And the question, and this is where the military courts come into the system or into the discussion and the prosecution of children comes into the discussion. The question is, how has that been achieved? And essentially the way that's been achieved um, is not unique to Israel-Palestine. Um, it's not unique to this conflict. But the way it's been, the strategy has been implemented is extremely efficient and successful. And it's essentially mass intimidation and collective punishment. And to explain how that works on a day-to-day -day basis, I would like you to imagine for a moment that you're uh, a junior military commander in the West Bank. As you'd expect, um, the West Bank is divided up into small military jurisdictions. And in, in charge of each of those smaller uh, military jurisdictions is a junior military commander. Um, and each one of those jurisdictions, uh, there may be simply one settlement and some Palestinian villages. Um, and that settlement might just include around 600 settlers or so. Now imagine, so you're that junior military commander and you essentially have to guarantee the protection of those 600 um, settlers in your jurisdiction. The problem is what do you do if, and you have to guarantee their protection from anything, anything from kidnapping, murder, to some kid throwing stones at them. Um, and when I say children throwing stones, that um, covers a whole range 
of circumstances. It can range from the relatively trivial, where children throw stones at the wall, of which, uh, which they get arrested for, right up to situations where uh, a youth might throw a stone at a, a vehicle traveling on a road at high speed. And obviously that can be extremely dangerous. So it's a whole spectrum of offenses. But the problem, uh, to look at it on a daily basis, imagine this. So imagine you're that junior military commander sitting at your, your desk, telephone rings, and you get a call from the local settlement saying that a group of young people have been seen standing on the edge of the road throwing stones. You know that if you send a couple of jeeps to investigate that, by the time you get there, by the time those jeeps get there, those individuals will, long, will be long gone. So that poses a dilemma for you. If if you decide to, if, if, if you take the view that, well, we can't identify the perpetrators, um, maybe we'll catch them tomorrow. Um, the problem with that approach is that that act of resistance has gone unpunished. And if that act of resistance goes unpunished, the chances are you will get uh, more resistance the next day and the day after and so, so on and so forth. Pretty quickly, you will probably find uh, the settlers in that jurisdiction taking the law into their own hands. Um, and pretty quickly, you will lose control of that section of territory which you're, um, you've been briefed to protect. You'll probably also find that if that situation continues, you'll be out of a job. That's not an option. But again, what do you do when people are resisting and you cannot positively identify those perpetrators? And essentially, the process that is, is followed uh, involves a number of assumptions. The military officer will make pretty much three assumptions. The first assumption is that um, the people throwing stones were Palestinian males. Um, in seven years of doing this work, for whatever reason, I haven't come across a case of a girl throwing a stone. Um, the next assumption you'll make is those individuals will probably be aged between 10 and 30 years old. And again, probably a reasonable assumption in the circumstances. And the final assumption will be that um, those individuals came from the nearest Palestinian village. And again, that's probably a reasonable assumption. Those assumptions then will be handed over to the local intelligence officer. For those of you who've seen the documentary, The Gatekeepers, you would have seen that um, every cent Palestinian center of population in the West Bank has um, assigned to it an intelligence officer, an Israeli intelligence officer. And that intelligence officer's job is to know everything there is to know about that village, population, uh, who's married to who, who's Hamas, who's Fatah. Um, perhaps more importantly, who has been detained before? In this system, like I said, it, it works out at about one in four men have been through this system. So the chances are there will be people from that village who have been detained before. Um, and just as it happens in jurisdictions all around the world, um, where the law enforcement uh, doesn't really know who to arrest. Sometimes you just round up a few of the usual suspects. But the final thing the intelligence officer will do is he will uh, look to see who are the informants in that village. Uh, after 47 years of occupation, there is a wide and extensive network of Palestinian informants in the West Bank. Um, it's difficult to get hard evidence of this because, for obvious reasons, um, but I've heard figures of upwards of 20,000 informants in the West Bank. And when you look at the way people are interrogated, um, that figure doesn't surprise me. In many of the cases, the affidavits we collect from children, they will say not only are they asked questions about uh, who else in the village might be involved in something, but in some cases there are active attempts to recruit that individual to provide an ongoing information. And that can be done in any number of ways. It can be done by offering inducements or by threatening that individual. So the intelligence officer will see who are the informants in the village, um, contact them, and find out if they have any information on who might be throwing stones at the road. From those sources, uh, a list will be compiled, a list of names um, of people who will be arrested. That list will be handed back to the junior military officer. That junior military officer will then plan a raid on that village. The raid might be during the day, it might be at night. The considerations there are if a military convoy goes into a Palestinian village during the day, there's a very good chance the young boys and men will come out and throw stones at it. Um, essentially, there will be major clashes. 
So um, if you look at some of the testimonies uh, provided by Breaking the Silence, you'll, you'll, um, they often refer to the fact that sometimes that is the desi desired effect to cause clashes, etc. cetera. Um, however, if that happens, uh, you can be sure a number of Palestinians are going to be injured, but also Israeli soldiers are probably going to be injured too. Um, and so that's something that officer will take into consideration. If the raid is at nighttime, um, the advantage of that is you're much less likely to get clashes, uh, less likely that Palestinians are going to be injured, less likely that Israeli soldiers are going to be injured. There's also another reason why you might want to go in to the village at night, and that is, um, and this is the work that uh, Salwa uh, focuses on a fair bit, the effect of continuous night raids onto Palestinian villages has um, essentially a terrorizing effect on that village. Um, people don't sleep, people don't know which houses are going to be raided. It's, um, to be frank, it's an excellent way of intimidating um, the population. Um, and if your job is to guarantee the protection of those 600 settlers, you essentially, uh, that may be your desired um, strategy to intimidate the uh, Palestinian communities near that settlement. Let's assume it's a night raid. Uh, these frequently occur about two o'clock in the morning. The army will go into their village in force, frequently 30 military vehicles or so. Um, the intelligence is very good. In seven years of doing the work, I think I've come across about five cases where the wrong house um, was identified. The house will be surrounded. There'll be um, a lot of commotion generally. Uh, there'll be loud banging on the front door. If the door's not opened quickly, it will be broken in, sometimes blown off its hinges. Um, another tactic which is sometimes employed is that the military will go in quietly. They have a device where the front door can be removed from its hinges without making a, any noise. The soldiers then will enter the house without anyone knowing, enter the bedrooms, and the first thing the family will know about any of this is there will be soldiers in the bedrooms. Again, if the objective is to intimidate, this is an excellent way of doing it. Either way, the family will be gathered into one room of the house, and then the commanding officer will compare the, um, the list of names that he has against the identity cards of the family. Once the individual who they have come to arrest has been identified, that person will be separated from the rest of the family, immediately tied and blindfolded. The manner of tying is generally a single zip tie, plastic tie you can tighten but you can't loosen. And what we frequently find is these ties are tightened um, uh, extremely tightly. Uh, the, re the, the issue there, I think, is um, not so much an, a deliberate attempt to cause additional pain to the individual who's tied, but bear in mind, these are frequently young conscripts who have been sent in there, 18, 19, 20-year-olds, and they've just received a briefing telling them that this village is extremely dangerous, full of people who want to kill them. So they're scared. They're nervous, they want to get in and out of that village as quickly as possible. When you're in that frame of mind, um, the likelihood of over-tightening these ties is quite high, and that's generally what the evidence suggests. Also with these ties, the more you struggle, the tighter they get. Uh, the tighter they get, the, the, uh, the, the more restriction there is of the blood flow, hands swell up, ties get tighter. Some people report being tied like this for five to 10 hours. Um, very little paperwork involved in this process. Uh, in the last 12 months, uh, we've seen uh, a small increase in documentation where the family is given a bit of paper telling them which interrogation the child will be taken to. But there's nothing like um, an arrest warrant. And where there is paperwork, this is happening in a very small percentage of cases. The, the overwhelming majority of cases, the parents are not told why the individual has been arrested or where that individual has been taken to. The situation is uh, chaotic. These households, are, uh, they're usually large households. Uh, there'll be small children generally in that house. They will be screaming and crying. Um, the soldiers come into the house generally in full battle gear. Um, they will have camouflage on their faces. Um, the parents will be yelling at the commanding officer, trying to get some information out of him. If you're that commanding officer and you're faced with this chaotic scene, you have one concern on your mind, and that is to get your unit out of that village safely and quickly. So you have to calm that situation down if you can. The way that is frequently done is the commanding officer will tell the family where taking your child away uh, for a few hours and will ret return him later. 
That very rarely happens. Um, but the reason uh, the family are told that is to try and settle things down. If that doesn't work and the family follow the soldiers out of the house, weapons will be turned on the family and they'll be ordered back into the house. Um, the soldiers then will depart with the detainees, put them in the back of military vehicles and drive off. Um, in about, I think it's 46% of the cases we recently documented out of a sample of 105 testimonies, the children reported that they were put on the metal floor of the military vehicles for transfer. Um, they're tied, they're blindfolded, lying on the metal floor. Um, the road system in the West Bank, most of the roads are quite rough. The children um, bump up and down on the metal floor, causing uh, greater injury and suffering to that child. Again, as with so many aspects of this system, that generally is not a deliberate attempt to harm that child. What it is, is simply uh, a matter of the number of seats in the vehicle. If there are enough seats for the soldiers and the children, the children will get a seat. If there are not enough seats uh, for the soldiers and the children, it will be the children who will be on the floor, or the detainees, whatever age they are. Once on the floor, it's not uncommon for the soldiers to put their boots on, on the child, um, sometimes pushing the child around a little bit. On the spectrum of things, the level of abuse at this stage is low, at the lower end of the spectrum. But if you're a, a child, you're, you're uh, tied, you're blindfolded, you don't know why you've been arrested, and you find yourself in this situation, the psychological impact is obviously uh, quite severe. Many children report hearing laughter at this stage, and I'm sure if you interviewed these soldiers, they would probably say, listen, maybe there was a bit of horseplay going on in the back of the vehicle. But again, if you're that child, what might be horseplay for the soldiers uh, can be something more severe for that child. Another practical aspect of this whole system is that many of the children will ultimately be handed over to Israeli police inside the settlement for interrogation. Uh, many of these interrogators don't start work until 8 or 9 o'clock in the morning. So the, um, the soldiers have to figure out what are we going to do with these detainees between 2 o'clock and 8 o'clock in the morning. Um, what will tend to happen is they will drive to one of the smaller settlements. Uh, most of the settlements have a small military, uh, an enclosure for the military, consisting of uh, prefabricated buildings, shipping containers, that sort of thing. Children will be taken out of the back of the military vehicle, um, either left on the ground, tied and blindfolded, or put in a shipping container. Um, and again, it's completely arbitrary. It will depend on who's on duty that day. Some um, officers ensure that the children are treated with dignity and respect, Hands are untied, blindfolds removed, given something to drink. In many cases, that doesn't happen. And I think that point in some ways highlights the, the corrosive nature of this system, that it's clearly damaging to the people who go through this system, who are at the receiving end of the system, but it's also corrosive to the um, uh, young conscripts who are, are put into this um, uh, situation and perform these tasks. And just like in any military anywhere in the world, I think when you uh, give the military the task of essentially policing civilians, um, within a very relatively short period of time, you will find wholesale uh, violations of human rights. Militaries are not designed or trained to police civilians. And after 47 years, you, uh, you see it at checkpoints, etc. You see a level of contempt has just um, um, pervaded the system. But again, it's arbitrary. You also find, like I said, examples where uh, someone will look out for the child's um, well-being. Eight o'clock in the morning, children or detainees would be put back in the military vehicles and then taken to um, one of the larger settlements and handed over to the police for interrogation. Under military law, the children have rights. So, for example, they have the right to silence. They must be informed that they have the right to consult with a lawyer. Those rights, though, in most cases, are not being fulfilled. Most children are not told that they have the right to silence. Um, and where they are informed that they can consult with a lawyer, what generally happens is if they are told that, which only happens in a minority of cases, the interrogator will tell the child you can consult with a lawyer, but then proceed to interrogate the child uh, before the child has had an opportunity to consult with a lawyer. Um, once inside the interrogation room, so by this stage this might be six to ten hours or so since the child was detained, most cases will have remained tied throughout that period. Hands will be painful if that's the case. Um, nothing to eat or drink in many cases. May not have been allowed to use the bathroom. Again, completely arbitrary. Depends on who was on duty. Um, but the most um, 
the thing that sort of impacts, according to the children, impacts them the most is that regardless of what happened to them physically, the thing that plays on their mind the most at this stage is that they know in most cases that their parents don't know where they are. Um, and that has a s strong psychological impact. The interrogator then will usually make a very general allegation against the child. Why do you throw stones at Israelis? Whether the child's been thrown stones or hasn't been thrown stones, he will invariably deny he's been doing anything. And then the interrogator essentially does what is necessary uh, to try and get a confession from that child. They, the interrogator will frequently tell the child that all of the other people who were, were arrested at the same time, they've all confessed against that child. So there's no point in the child not confessing. Uh, there's often a degree of intimidation, shouting, sometimes threatening the child. Um, the threats can be anything from long-term detention, physical violence. Um, the interrogator will know if the child's father has a work permit to work inside Israel, the threat might be we'll revoke your father's work permit. Um, generally, that will succeed after one or two hours. Um, in about two-thirds of the cases we documented, the children were then shown documentation written in Hebrew, language they don't understand. When the children challenge this and say, you know, what is this document? I don't, I don't understand what it says. They're usually told by the interrogator that that is their statement. That is what the child has told the interrogator. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. There's no way for that child to know. Within two to four days, the child will be brought before a military court. There are two military courts in the West Bank. Um, that's where the child will generally see his lawyer for the first time. Um, the civilian rules of evidence apply in these courts. Under, those, under the Israeli um, civilian rules of evidence, um, confessions must be given voluntarily. Um, the overwhelming majority of children will end up pleading guilty, even though the majority of them also say they've been coerced somehow. So the question there is, if most children are saying they're being coerced, and um, that evidence can be challenged, the admissibility of that evidence can be challenged, why is it so rare for any lawyer in these courts to ever challenge it, which is, is the case. It's, they're very rarely challenged, unless the individual is charged with a very serious offense and, it, and can f is expecting a year or more in prison, um, which is not the case with most of these children. And what's going on there is this. Essentially, let's say the, the child approaches the lawyer and says, I'm innocent, I was coerced, these dreadful things happened to me, that's why I signed a confession. What are my options? The lawyer will generally tell the child, um, I know you say you're innocent, but if you plead guilty, um, I can get you a deal from the prosecution of about, on average, two to three months in prison. Depends on the circumstances of the case. Might be, might be less, might be more. If, on the other hand, you want us to challenge the system, you will almost certainly be denied bail, which means you will remain in detention till your case comes on for final hearing. These cases generally do not come on for final hearing for four to six months. And so essentially, the quickest way to get out of this system is to plead guilty, uh, whether you're innocent or guilty. Um, and that's essentially what happens. And I think that also partly goes to explain the conviction rate in these courts, which according to the military courts themselves is 99.74%. Following that process, according to the Israeli prison service, in 90% of cases uh, involving adults, and 50% of cases involving children, those detainees will be transferred to prisons inside Israel. That's a clear violation of Article 76 of the Fourth Geneva Convention. Under the convention, all of the prisons, all of the detainees must be held uh, within the West Bank. Um, just to sort of speed things along a, li a little bit, um, one question that frequently arises is, if you put young people through a system like this, when they come out of that system, don't they simply just run off to the local Hamas recruiting office? And you can find cases of that, but generally that's not what happens. Where you get young people getting involved in um, armed struggle um, is usually because uh, uh, someone in their family has been killed. That's the most common reason. What happens with detention is generally the opposite. Um, what generally happens is the children come out of the system, most of them will have some level of post-traumatic stress disorder. And most children will say they never want to see another soldier again in their lives. Also, another aspect of this system is there are generally three components to the sentencing process. There will be 
a custodial sentence, two to three months on average. There will be a fine between 1,000 and 4,000 shekels generally, which is a lot of money uh, usually for these families. The third component will be a suspended sentence. Uh, it's usually um, three to six months suspended for two years. And what that means is once the child is released, if he's in his village, let's say he's just going down to the shops, and suddenly soldiers come into the village, um, and there's a clash, which is frequently the case. When clashes occur, people scatter in all directions. And they scatter for a number of reasons. One, because they were involved in the clashes and they don't want to get arrested. And in other cases, because they were just bystanders and they don't want to get arrested. But the soldiers, if they see someone running, they're just going to grab someone who's running because uh, that suggests that that person was involved. So you might be in that vicinity. You may not be involved. You might be running. If you're caught and there's a suspended sentence um, outstanding, you'll go straight back to prison. And so that has a, is a very effective way of ensuring that uh, most of these children will just run home um, and stay home. Um, and again, getting back to where we started this, if you're that junior military commander, essentially the job has been done. You have intimidated that, um, uh, the residents of that village um, effectively, and the chances of getting any um, widespread resistance from them um, is minimal. And if there is resistance, then you just keep doing this process until it stops. What I've just described is what I would call the reactive strategy. Someone has been resisting. Someone has been throwing stones. The nearest village will pay a price for that until it stops. There's also something that's even more common, and that's the proactive strategy. Um, and that is you don't even wait for someone to resist. You go into the village um, to intimidate and to essentially occupy people's minds. Once the mind is occupied, there is very little space um, for those individuals to come up with any sort of counter strategy. And I'll just, um, um, I, I think the proactive strategy has been best described by uh, breaking the silence. And I'll just read you out a very small uh, passage in a testimony um, uh, from an Israeli soldier who describes this proactive strategy. And essentially what this uh, soldier is talking about is uh, his unit um, was stationed up north in the West Bank near Nablus. There's a strategic road intersection there, travels, the road goes east to west, north to south. There are a number of settlements around there, um, and there's also many Palestinian villages. And the question is, how do you control those Palestinian villages, protect those settlers, protect the strategic road junction? And according to the soldier, this is how you do it. A patrol goes in uh, to the village and raises hell. A whole company may be sent in on foot in two lines like a military parade in the streets, provoking riots, provoking children. The commander is bored and wants to show off to his battalion commander, and he does it at the expense of his subordinates. He wants more and more friction, just to grind the population, make their lives more and more miserable, and to discourage them from throwing stones, to not even think about throwing stones at the main road, not to mention Molotov cocktails or other things. Practically speaking, it worked. The population was so scared, they shut themselves in. And that, in co conjunction with the reactive strategy, is how you get to the situation where you have 400,000 civilians in occupied territory. And again, not to trivialize it, but in the last three years, seven w only seven were killed. It's mass intimidation, <coughs> collective punishment, and it is extremely effective. Having said that, it, of course, builds up massive resentment within the civilian population. And the question is, where will all that resentment and frustration go? At some point, that situation will explode. Um, I'll just uh, conclude by saying, um, essentially, we make six recommendations uh, to address this issue. Um, the focus of these recommendations um, is on the first 24 hours, because that's where most of the problems occur. Um, the difficulty in making recommendations is that you don't simply want to necessarily make this just a best practices occupation. You actually want to um, uh, try and address some of the fundamental issues. And the six recommendations are essentially no night, uh, no night arrests unless they're absolutely necessary. Um, these children have rights. They must be informed of their rights in Arabic uh, at the time of arrest. That's not happening. Um, the children have the right to consult with a lawyer. Um, that right is generally not respected. It must be respected. Every child should be accompanied by a parent during the interrogation. Presumably in response to this, an interrogator 
would refute that anything untoward is happening in the interrogation room. If that's the case, there should be no complaint about having a parent in the interrogation room. The, um, the fifth recommendation is that every interrogation should be audiovisually recorded. Um, that not only provides some protection to the child, it also uh, provides protection to the interrogator against any false allegations of wrongdoing. And the final one is if any of those five are missing, then the prosecution must be discontinued and the child released. Um, what I might do now is hand over to my colleague Sawa, who will talk a little bit about the impact of all of this on, on the families who are left behind. Um, if you visit the website of Military Court Watch, you will find at least 100 uh, testimonies of children. You will read all the details that Gerard does just described. But what you will not find in these testimonies is the devastating psychological effect that such an experience has on the children that leaves a scar that lasts uh, almost a lifetime. And this is what I would like to um, uh, talk a little bit about. Um, so usually when the child goes home after two or three months uh, in prison, the family will throw a party for the boy. They will uh, cook the best food, invite friends and family, and make him feel like a, a hero, thinking that, thank God, finally the problems are over. But in fact, what, what later um, they find out when the party is over is that the problems had just begun. Uh, the mothers usually talk about how the children wake up in the middle of the night with night, um, nightmares. They don't sleep well. They lose interest in uh, socializing um, with their friends because simply they don't trust them. They don't know who of their friends uh, reported them to the authorities, either because they are uh, collaborators uh, uh, or because they could not withstand the pressure when they themselves went through this experience and had to just drop a name of a boy in order to get out of a difficult situation. Um, boys often um, um, drop out of school. First of all, they uh, lost two or three months of school, um, and they find it hard to catch up. And uh, second of all, they uh, basically don't find the energy to pull themselves together to um, force themselves to go back to school. And a child without education is a child without, is a person without, um, um, a future. Um, when the boy comes home, he, rem he is reminded that the last thing he saw before he was taken away in the jeep was his father being humiliated by uh, soldiers, pushed around, not being told uh, you know, exact information about why he's being taken away and where he's, being go where he's going to be taken to. Uh, his mother crying hysterically, unable to do anything, his siblings crying. So a, a chaotic scene that happened inside that boy's house, and he um, feels s deeply insecure. He feels that his parents failed to protect him. Um, and this translates into you know, lo losing respect for the, for the parents who could not, uh, could not protect him. The fathers feel vulnerable and humiliated, and f as, you know, they feel as, uh, as if they have failed uh, to provide their uh, uh, children with, uh, with what they need. Mothers actually don't go to sleep until five in the morning. You know, this is just an example of how frequent these, uh, these events are in certain villages near settlements where settlements have been built. They go to bed at five in the morning because they want to be awake when there's a knock at the door to, to gently try to wake their um, uh, children up and to prepare them. Uh, the mothers who have not uh, been through such an experience actually s uh, show severe physical symptoms of stress, uh, um, of fear, of the their worst nightmare coming true any time. Uh, to give you an example of how frequent these events are also, uh, in just one village near Ramallah, the village is called Der Nidam, just about 20 minutes. Uh, in May of this month, it was raided 16 times in just one month. So every other day, there was a night raid. And it doesn't mean that on each of these night raids, somebody was arrested. No. What usually happens is the army will go in, make their presence felt, make a lot of noise, sirens, maybe tear gas, stun grenades, uh, so that the villagers wake up and they 
are wondering whose turn is it? Who is it my house? Is it my neighbor's house? Is it my cousin's house? And um, the, the amount of stress and resentment that builds up is simply un unimaginable. It leaves parents totally helpless. They, the message is that there's nothing really they can do to protect their children, especially since the system works in such a way that it doesn't make um, enough effort to distinguish between those who are guilty and who, those who are not. Um, it, is, it is a system that um, who its main objective is to inject fear in the population, to have enough people go through the system that, that they uh, don't even think about objecting to settlements being built next door to their houses, to their land being taken, to their uh, freedom of movement being restricted. And this is, uh, this is where the system really works. It has succeeded for uh, such a long time. This is exactly, this is the only way you actually can do occupation for 47 years. Take land, uh, move settlers there. Settlers have pretty good life. They get um, incentives from the government. They get uh, all sorts of benefits. Uh, and this is what happens day in, day out for 47 years. And this is what we don't hear in the, in the media. We hear, we, 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 we hear about it when something bad happens, when there's a killing or there's you know, an, an incident. W what we don't hear in the media is when um, you know, settlers go to work every day, pick up their children from school, <laughs> go to the hospitals, go to work, and come back home, and nothing really happens. But what is actually happens uh, on these days when events don't make it to the news is a buildup of resentment that will one day find its way out in a very bad and negative, um, negative way. So where does this all leave us? Uh, Palestinians are in despair. They keep being promised, you know, they will have their state one day, there will be two states, two state solutions, this is what the American uh, leadership is telling us <laughs> this is what the peace process is all about. Um, but they look at the facts on the ground and their daily lives, and they know that this is not going to happen any any time soon. And what this is making them uh, think and say is, okay, Israel, you have won. You won two wars. You control over 60 percent of what is left for Palestinians to build their um, state on. Um, you have set half a million settlers living in occupied territory. So what we want now is our rights. We cannot live on forever without exercising, first of all, our right to self-determination, out of which all sorts of different other rights uh, flow. And this is where we are today. And if we don't do anything about it immediately, I don't know what we can do, uh, it's going to end up really bad for the Palestinians for sure, but I think also for the Israelis. Their reputation is going down the drain very slowly. The winds are l blowing in a different direction. We saw in the uh, UK uh, parliament the vote in favor of a Palestinian state. Other, s other states in Europe maybe will follow suit, who knows. Maybe nothing will happen. Maybe this reputational thing is not a big deal for uh, Israel. Who knows? But it's probably a gamble uh, to let it deteriorate in that direction and not really do something about it. Um, thank you very much. I mean, if you have questions, we'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. There are about 30 lawyers who appear regularly in the military courts. They're mostly Palestinian, but some Israeli lawyers as well. Um, it's a mix of um, um, uh, NGO lawyers, lawyers provided by the Palestinian Ministry of uh, Detainees. Um, those lawyers are provided free of charge. Um, when I say free of charge, the, ultimately the money comes from 
presumably American taxpayers and European taxpayers. There's no, uh, the military authorities don't provide any form of legal aid. Um, there's also a tendency among some families that um, they look around for lawyers, what's on offer, and they think, well, that group of lawyers are f for free. Presumably, if I pay a lot of money, um, I can get a better lawyer. So some people will then go to private lawyers, but the results are pretty much the same. And then, like I said, there are some Israeli lawyers who will also appear in the military courts as well. I'm not uh, sure of the, the exact figure, but many of those settlers, yes, will be to the east of the wall, so that they get no protection from the wall. Um, it's always interesting talking to, um, having tours from sol former soldiers from Breaking the Silence too, who you know, discuss that, the, the effect of the wall, and you know, the, how the wall uh, doesn't extend all the way down south, so you can go around the wall if you want to go, uh, if you want to do that. Um, and the main issue with the wall, obviously, is that any state on earth is perfectly entitled to build a wall. You just have to build it on your own territory. And that's what the International Court of Justice found. That the overwhelming majority of the wall is built uh, to the east of the Green Line, uh, which is illegal. Also, there are holes in the wall. So <laughs> it's very easy to go around the wall. It's not complete yet. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm no expert on the wall, so I, I can't, you know, I, I've heard arguments going either way that um, the wall does provide protection, um, but I think a degree of common sense tells you that if it doesn't go all the way south, you know, people presumably can go around the, the wall too. Also, there's another factor that currently I think there are about 5,500 approximately Palestinians held as security prisoners. There's an additional about 2,000 Palestinian prisoners in Israeli jails held as what they call criminal prisoners. And the most common criminal offense is entering Israel without a permit. So thousands of people, Palestinians, attempt to cross into Israel every day for work. Um, and many, most of them get through and work in Israel every day. So it's quite porous. Um, because it's gone on for so long, um, quite often you have a, a reasonable idea where your child might be. So, for example, if, you're, if you live in, um, say, Bet Uma, uh, just beyond the Gush Etzion settlement block, and you're arrested there, um, the parents will know you will probably be in somewhere in Gush It uh, doesn't mean you can, you can go there and visit them or anything, but you will probably be there. Uh, that child will probably be there. Again, if it's a more serious offense and they're going to be interrogated by the Shin Bet, they might be taken to Jerusalem or Petah Tikva or somewhere else inside Israel for interrogation. Um, so, um, so that's one way they can have a, uh, a sort of guess where the child might be. Frequently, when the child is brought to the military court two days later, often the parents will not be there because they haven't been informed that the child will be in court that day. What will happen is the judge... Um, will make inquiries and first of all check that the child has a lawyer. If, if the child doesn't have a lawyer, he will look around the courtroom and say, okay, you represent that child today. What will happen then is information from the lawyer, the child will give information to the lawyer and that will get back to the parents. Um, so that's frequently um, how that, that occurs. Regarding visits, um, the Before the child is sentenced, the main way parents visit the child is in the courtroom. 
Um, doesn't mean you can talk to the child, but you get to see the child. And some of these court appearances are five minutes or so, um, but that's the sort of contact. What, uh, what you can do is you can apply for a permit to visit somebody in prison. Like I said, uh, most of these prisons are inside Israel. Um, whether the one prison is in the West Bank, off a prison, but it's to the um, uh, west of the wall. So in a sense, it might as well be in Israel. When you apply for a permit, a number of things happen. Um, it can be denied for unspecified security reasons, so you won't get a permit. Um, it can be granted, but the, um, what we frequently find is the bureaucracy for obtaining a permit sometimes can take up to one to two months. And so sometimes you get a situation where um, uh, a permit is granted after the child has actually been released. Where a permit is granted, the uh, you, two family members can visit uh, once every two weeks for 45 minutes non-contact uh, visit. There's no, telef there's no official tele um, telephone communication whilst in prison. It's, uh, there's not much protection. Um, I mean, there's been, uh, UNICEF made 38 recommendations about how children should be treated, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what, one of the recommendations was, uh, um, and the response to this is, okay, if you don't arrest children at night, it means you've got to send the military into the village during the day. If you send the military into the village during the day, there's going to be a riot. If there's a riot, more Palestinians are going to get hurt and Israeli soldiers are going to get hurt. So that sometimes uses it as, as an argument for arresting people at night. But um, one of the recommendations that has been made is that summonses should be uh, used instead of night raids. And um, an attempt was made, I think, from the evidence it appears, a pilot study was introduced in April of this year to issue summonses instead of night raids. Now, what we found with that is that there's only been a small reduction in the number of night raids. It went down from, I think, the proportion 49% down to, I think, 47 or 46%. Um, another thing we found in a relatively small sample that we managed to collect, that in two-thirds of the cases also, uh, the summonses were issued in the middle of the night by the soldiers. So soldiers show up at 2 o'clock in the morning and deliver the summons. So it kind of defeats the purpose a little bit. Um, Another case, and it's, it's a next attached to our latest report, uh, one of the summonses that we managed to get hold of, um, it was written in Hebrew and Arabic as a pro forma document, but then it had spaces for the details to be handwritten in, and those hand, that handwritten information was written in Hebrew. So uh, very problematic. Um, what we did find, though, in, in the small number of cases where a summons was issued during the day and the family the child complied with that summons. That did, in fact, drastically reduce the, um, that ho the, the level of abuse um, because so much of the, um, like I described, you know, it occurs from 2 o'clock in the morning until 8 o'clock in the morning, that being left out in, in the elements, being tied, etc. If a summons is delivered and it's responded to and the child goes during the day, it means he's not blindfolded, he's not tied, he's not left somewhere, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's still lots of problems with the whole system, obviously. Um, but that um, has, does have a dramatic effect. Um, but what we're seeing is, like I say, it, it's hardly being used, and most of the time the summonses, summonses are being delivered, it's quite unsatisfactory. Now, reading between the lines a little bit, I can quite see why that's the case, in the sense that these, if your job as the military commander is to guarantee the protection of the settlers. One of the essential tools in your toolbox, as it were, 
is the night raid. It's very effective at intimidating the local population. And the problem is, if you bring in too many changes to the benefit of the Palestinian communities, they're not going to be intimidated, and then you're not going to be able to guarantee the protection of the settlers. And that's the, you know, we get back to the, the big picture of illegal settlement construction in occupied territory. So um, we have a, a bit more time, and I'm, uh, I'm going to press you a little bit more. Um, you referred, uh, Gerard, to the UNICEF report, and I guess I want to know two things. As I understand, that's the report that came out in 2013. So who's following up on whether the recommendations are being complied with, and are there ways that internationals, that would be American attorneys as well as, I guess, attorneys from Australia and from England, are there ways that internationals can sort of um, see that the UNICEF uh, report is being complied with? Are there steps that we can take? So UNICEF made 38 recommendations, and the response from the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs was to thank UNICEF for the report and to say that they would work with UNICEF to implement the recommendations. What we do is every six months we, we produce a report uh, monitoring how that process is coming along. Um, there have, what's interesting is that, and there has been quite a lot of attention on this issue in the UK Parliament, some of the other European parliaments, and at the UN level. And um, there is a sort of dialogue going on. Um, and what we are seeing, which is, I think, a new development, is there have been some changes to the military laws. Um, in many of those six categories that I referred to, like the uh, summonses in, in lieu of night arrests, etc. Another example is in, on the 10th of September last month, the uh, military commander in the West Bank issued Military Order 1745, in which it, he said that uh, interrogations of minors by the police in the West Bank must be audio-visually recorded. But then you read the fine print, and it only applies to non-security-related offenses. Um, throwing stones is a security-related offense, under Military Order 101, attending an unauthorized protest is a security-related offense. Very few children um, go through the military courts prosecuted with a non-security-related offense. And that's essentially what we're seeing, that we've gone, I think, from a situation of complete denial that there's a problem. Um, you know, maybe there's a few bad apples here and there, but there is no serious problem, to an acknowledgement by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that there is a problem and that they will work with UNICEF to implement them. And there has been some implementation, but the way it translates in reality is it's, at the moment, I think essentially a public relations exercise. Um, there's no real substantive improvement. But I have to say that's often the way change occurs. It goes from um, denial to a public relations problem, and then we'll have to see from here on in uh, where it goes. Uh, in which direction from that public relations point of view. Um, so I think um, one important thing that anyone who's interested can do is constantly monitor how those recommendations are going. Our estimate is, and it's slightly subjective, but our estimate is that 5% of the recommendations have been substantially implemented. Um, so there's been you know, little effective implementation at the moment. Um, but it is sort of being managed as a public relations problem. Um, and I think the more people who can focus on that issue and keep a close eye on how that's going can potentially make some difference. Before we move on to the next question, I am just going to do a, a little advertisement. So Military Court Watch, um, where some of these reports are vested and you can find and you can follow up with the work that they're doing, it's www.militarycourtwatch dot org and um, we'll have a few cards available as well so if you want to follow up on these reports that's uh, a good source that you can use yes just um, on my way here I talked to a friend who was calling not related to any of this from New York and when I told her where I was going and what the topic was she said she couldn't she's a well-informed thoughtful New Yorker and couldn't believe that this was happening and one of the things, this won't, 
you know, my suggestion, or I guess my question is, what kind of public relations campaign from our side could we have and is happening? Because one of the things that I think you alluded to was a shift, a subtle shift that's happening in the larger American community um, in, in support of Palestinians because the lockstep support for Israel in light of all these terrible things that are now coming to the surface and have been obviously happening for 48 years, but um, you know, people haven't known about um, necessarily. Um, you know, is there a campaign? Are there strategies for having a much broader conversation with the mainstream American population? Because they're abhorrent. You mm -hmm. can't listen to this and not want to scream and cry. Um, I'm amazed that none of us are, um, but uh, you know it's 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 uh, rage-inducing. And so, if there are ways that we could popularize, I hate to use that word, but the horror of this in a way that more Americans, more British, more other folks around the globe would know, there'd be a, I would hope a diminishment of the kind of um, tight rein. There's, um, there was a, a documentary, a documentary was shown on Australian prime time television earlier this year called Stone Cold Justice, and it's online. And I think a million Australians saw that. It was also a co-production with the Australian newspaper, which is owned by Rupert Murdoch. Um, and that had quite a profound effect. There was a seven page spread in the newspaper. So that got out to a much broader audience. Um, and I think it opened up a bit of a discussion um, so mainstream media obviously is important. Uh, the, the issue is better known in Britain. Um, one reason being that uh, many British parliamentarians have visited the military courts. And I think that's something that um, you can consider as, uh, as Americans is that something like 200 members of Congress visit Israel every year. And only a fraction of them uh, go across the green line in any meaningful way. And what that strikes me as a very dangerous situation. Um, when I practiced as a barrister, my experience was if my client came in and told me half of the story, the chances of me giving that client good legal advice was next to nothing. And it's if your elected officials are getting half of the story, not to tell them what, what their policy should be, but it does seem to me that if you only get half of the story, there's a high probability you're gonna get junk foreign policy out of that. And I think just demanding that um, just as they should be listening to um, Israeli officials hearing about the security concerns that they have. They must also hear about some of these other issues as well um, in order to get a more balanced view. But there is also a campaign in America running on this issue, and I'll hand it over to the expert on that. Oh, well, okay, but before we say anything about that, I have to ask Gerard to tell us the backstory, how Stone Cold Justice came about, because that's probably a model for what we could be doing here in the United States. Well, a, lo a lot of it is about um, just building up, I think, trust and, um, and contacts with, with um, uh, more mainstream journalists. Um, and the problem is this is such a sort of contentious issue that if, um, you know, if, if the way it is presented is very, um, you know, extreme in the language used, et cetera, unmeasured or involves a lot of exaggeration, it's less likely that a mainstream journalist will want to touch it. And so it is about how do you present good, credible evidence um, that is more likely to attract the attention of a mainstream journalist. And so that's something I think we all need to consider is um, how to get more of a broader discussion in the mainstream media on some of these issues. In addition, um, we do have uh, Chicago Faith Coalition uh, 
is working with the American Friends Service Committee, and we have a campaign. It's called Israeli Military Detention, No Way to Treat a Child, and there's some uh, pamphlets out on the desk. Um, you know, like us and follow the campaign, because as we do that, we're putting information on our website about the ways children are being treated in, in, in military detention so that you can follow some of the stories of individual children. Uh, we're also linking back to some of the work that Military Court Watch is doing so that that substantive um, um, building the case as, as attorneys we're all familiar with, it's really about holding those facts and making those facts clear that helps us, you know, uh, make a prevailing case, and so that's part of what uh, the No Way to Treat a Child campaign is uh, is uh, working on. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Bridge Kay, I'm a journalist, and I had the pleasure of meeting Salwa and um, Gerard last year, and um, Gerard told very sim talked very similarly. Um, opening tomorrow night is a uh, photo exhibition. Um, it's called Night Raid on Berlin, which is a tiny town near Ramallah. And um, um, the exhibit actually has much of Gerard's uh, speech, word for word, on the walls. But the, the words are actually put between, uh, between 16 kind of life-size pictures of residents of Berlin. I was so moved by what they said that on the last night I was there, I went door to door and conducted a photographic night raid and literally asked people if they would pose by their front door so you can see <coughs> what, what, what these people who are targets really look like. What, where is where the exhibit? It's at Artworks Projects, which is at 625 Kingsbury, about a block north of the East Bank Club. And tomorrow night is the opening. It's at 625. Uh, so if you look at Artworks Projects, you'll be able to see that. And then it'll be up all weekend? It will be up for a month. It's uh, very strange hours. I'm going to be there on Saturday afternoon from 1 to 5. And if you want to come and see the pictures and talk to me, um, I, they were the, the most ins influential uh, people that we, that we met in, in the West Bank. Thank you. I, I'm going to interrupt you just for, because we only have another uh, five minutes with uh, 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 Sawa and Gerard. And I ha so I have uh, the question I, I think I, I heard implicit in some of the questioning that was going on is, so Sawa, what are the psychological and social supports that um, are being offered or that are available for the mothers and for the families and for the children that are being affected by the uh, military detention system? Well, this is so widespread that it is, uh, you know, you have to provide the psychological uh, help to uh, entire communities, which is impossible. That is why the priorities should be given to addressing the root causes of what's causing these traumatic experiences for the children and for their, um, for their families. Um, on the ground, there are organizations that provide um, counseling. Uh, one of them is the YMCA, based in Beit Sahur. I think they have the capacity to um, provide counseling for about 350 children, which is probably less than half the number of children arrested each year. They do it individually with the child, collectively with lots of children who have been through the experience. And they also provide help with, uh, to the families. Uh, this is often what happens. I you know, walk into the house of a family and I see a broken child. You know, it's really very sad. And I suggest that there might be somebody who can help. And the first person in the room to jump and deny that there's a need for help is the father, who himself had already gone through the same experience. And uh, he looks at me and says, no, 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 he's OK. He's a hero. Nothing's wrong with him. Look at me. I went through the experience, and I'm fine. But then the mother looks at me and says, please, I beg you, any kind of help is more than welcome. And I tell you what, my husband needs it too, not only my son. <laughs> so the mothers are usually very um, upfront about it. But uh, un unless we deal with the root causes of the problems, it's just simply giving aspirin pills to a cancer. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question before our, our guests have to leave. I'm going to move on uh, to the next part of this program. All right. Um, well, thank you, Sawa and uh, Gerard. Thank you very much. But we're going to move on. Um, 
One of the things that Rich was talking about in his art exhibit he, that he called Night Raid uh, uh, on Berlin, many of you know Berlin was the subject of the film Five Broken Cameras and Iyad Bernat was an activist and he was filming the demonstrations um, along the wall. Berlin has been engaged in these nonviolent uh, protests for uh, uh, a long period of time. And so, as happens in Palestine, in the occupied territories, activists become targeted um, for, their, for their actions. And so, Dima Khalidi um, founded, she's the director of an organization called Palestine Solidarity Legal Support, um, whose mission is to protect the activists here in the United States that engage in activities to raise awareness about the uh, situation uh, with Palestinians and what the conditions are like, including conditions of children in military uh, detention. She's the uh, uh, founder and director of the Palestine uh, Solidarity Legal Support. She's also the co uh, cooperating counsel uh, on the Center for Constitutional Rights. And her work, of course, includes providing legal advice to activists, engaging in advocacy to uh, protect activists. So help me welcome uh, Dima Khalidi. Thank you all. Um, you'll have to bear with me. My voice is failing me, but uh, please let me know if you can't hear me and I'll do my best to raise my voice. This microphone is not for you all. It's for um, the camera, apparently. So um, let me know if you can't hear me for any reason. As Paula said, uh, Palestine Solidarity Legal Support works to protect the rights of people here in the US to speak freely about Israel and Palestine. Um, we do a number of things, including uh, providing direct legal advice to people who are facing backlash. Uh, we provide Know Your Rights trainings for students and other activists uh, to make them aware of what their rights are in the, in the case that they do face backlash. And we do advocacy around these issues um, around the country. So we are based in Chicago, but we uh, really cover, cover the country. Uh, well, I want to transition from Israel, Palestine, uh, to the United States. I think Gerard and Selwa made very clear the systematic nature of the criminalization uh, of Palis any kind of Palestinian resistance, any kind of uh, even appearance of resistance, um, and, and that the real, uh, the real purpose of a lot of the tactics used by the Israeli military is intimidation um, to, to keep the Palestinian population down, uh, and, and the use of arrest, imprisonment, uh, et cetera, of those, of those who uh, arrest, uh, resist or even just exist as Palestinians it is systematic and, and widespread. Um, just so, uh, it, you know, it, I'm sorry, there's a report here by an organization called Adamir um, that works for the rights of Palestinian prisoners. And I think they get, do a great job of explaining the ways that all kinds of Palestinian resistance is criminalized. So I encourage you to look at this for, for more information on that. Um, I, I'd also like to point out that uh, I think that what Gerard and Senua were talking about focused on the West Bank, the occupied Palestinian territories. And uh, I think it's also important to note that a lot of the same repression happens within uh, the 1948 territories, what is known as Israel now. Um, uh, you know, if, if you know of some Israeli laws, uh, you're not allowed to talk about the Nakba, the, uh, the uh, 1948 um, uh, expulsion of uh, three quarters of a million Palestinians. Um, you are not allowed to advocate for boycott, divestment, and sanctions. Um, it, you, you can be sued for it. Um, so it's not exclusively uh, um, in the, the occupied territories where there's a military occupations, occupation. It's also within Israel itself. 
uh, where a lot of this repression of activism and resistance is, is happening. Um, so uh, again, it's a whole regime meant to, to keep down the Palestinian population. So from Israel uh, to the US, I think it's important to, uh, what I'd like to do is really highlight the ways that, uh, that activism here is being suppressed. Uh, we think of this country, of course, as a democracy, as a place where uh, free speech is protected, is held, in fact, uh, is sanctified. Um, uh, but it seems often these days that uh, there, is, there may be a Palestine exception to the First Amendment. Um, more and more we're seeing people who speak out about Palestine, who dare to criticize Israel uh, when our government is uh, uh, wholeheartedly supportive of Israel when you know um, it, you have complete bipartisan support for uh, for Israel, um, any kind of dissent on this issue is uh, is 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 attacked. Um, so so that's what I'd like to focus on, and and the ways that that is happening in this country. Um, notably, I think as as uh, some folks alluded to, there really is a rise, it seems, there's, there may be a shift happening in support for Palestinian rights among the, the people, among the grassroots, and that is being manifested in demonstrations, certainly after this uh, bloody summer uh, when Gaza was under attack for weeks. Um, and, and thousands, uh, uh, there were thousands of Palestinian casualties. Um, uh, you know, people came out on, in the streets in the, in the thousands to uh, express their outrage and their solidarity with Palestinians. And, uh, and this has been happening for, uh, for quite a while, actually, certainly since Cass led uh, in 2008, 2009. The, the level of atrociousness of, of what Israel is doing uh, in front of, of the world. Uh, it's being broadcasted on social media um, and, and in the media. Uh, has really galvanized people to speak out on this issue. So we are seeing a rise in activism, also helped by a growing campaign for boycott, divestment, and sanctions of Israel. Um, so there are increasing campaigns to, to try to hold Israel accountable somehow since no international or other mechanisms seem to work. Um, uh, so, so this is really the context that we're, that we're working in. Um, but alongside this rise in activism, we're also seeing a rise in repression. And uh, I think it's important to note where this repression is coming from here in this country. There is no uh, military, Israeli military occupation. Uh, but what we are dealing with here is a big constituency of Israel advocacy groups that uh, work very hard to hold the line, to maintain the status quo on Israel-Palestine in this country, to make sure that US policy uh, remains uh, entirely in favor of Israel. Um, so these, these advocacy groups are engaging in a number of different tactics meant to silence, intimidate, um, uh, repress activism on this issue. And uh, this is aided and uh, uh, reinforced by the US government itself, which, uh, which engages in broad-based surveillance uh, and criminalization of, uh, uh, of advocacy for Palestinian rights, but also things like charity, um, uh, especially Muslim charity, um, and, and other activities in the US. And, and, and uh, public and private institutions, too, are uh, contributing to, to this sense of repression. So, um, it, you know, these, these groups, these uh, advo Israel advocacy organizations have really been laying out uh, their plan uh, to, to repress this kind of activism for years. And, uh, you know, they, they 
talk about it, uh, it as, as ways to battle the, what they call the delegitimization of Israel. Um, so, you, you know, the, the attacks are really focused on undermining the motivations of human rights activists, saying they don't really actually care about human rights. What they, uh, they, they are just anti-Semitic. They are doing this to destroy Israel um, because they don't, they hate Jewish people. So um, that is an underlying tactic of a lot of these attacks on Palestinian rights activists to really undermine the motivations behind what they do. Um, the strategies that they use are really broad-based and they range from legislation to uh, uh, lawsuits to uh, pressuring universities and other institutions to uh, discipline or punish or condemn activism. So, um, Um, so these are some of the trends we're seeing in the repression and what PSLS does is really try to document um, uh, the, the kind of repression happening and so we have an intake line and, and folks call us and tell us about, uh, uh, about the things that they're, that they're facing. Um, just in the last two years, we were only founded in 2012 and we um, launched our intake line in, in 2013. Just, um, just this year, we've documented over 200 uh, incidents of repression uh, and, and reports of, uh, of repression. So uh, the numbers are rising, and uh, you know we we are hearing more and more uh, about uh, you know uh, various kinds of, of issues that Palestinian rights activists are facing, um, and and. You know, they really range from the smallest kind of uh, 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 harassment, um, administrative harassment of college students to uh, government prosecutions, criminal prosecutions. Um, so, so these are the broad kind of uh, uh, categories of repression that we're seeing. Surveillance and infiltration mainly carried out by the government, uh, criminal prosecutions, uh, disparate treatment, uh, uh, Usually, we work about 80% of our cases deal with university students because of the focus, because uh, campuses are now the, the low focus points of this activism in the US, um, and therefore a focus of the repression as well. So disparate treatment uh, by universities often of their students, um, changing, changing rules, and then lawsuits and legislation. And these cases that we're documenting, again, are just the tip of the iceberg, really. Um, we, we don't hear about uh, uh, the vast majority of, of issues that, that are happening. So uh, it's important for, for people to continue telling us about, about these kinds of issues that they're happening. Surveillance and infiltration. Um, I think we've, we've been hearing plenty about the NSA, um, about the, the massive surveillance that the U.S. government is engaging in. Um, you know, uh, when was it? A, a couple of years ago, the, there, there was an expose about the, the dragnet surveillance that the NYPD, the New York Police Department, was engaging in. Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, usually we're talking about a focus on Amemsa communities, Arab, um, Middle Eastern, Muslim, South Asian uh, communities. And the, the New York Police Department was visiting restaurants and barbershops and uh, mosques and uh, student groups and uh, you know, sending agents on field trips with the Muslim Students Association uh, reporting about, oh, they're praying five times a day. Um, so, so the surveillance is uh, deep and widespread, and uh, we're, we're learning more and more about it. And of course, it's not new in this country's history. We, we know well uh, uh, about the surveillance that happened in the 60s and 70s of, uh, uh, of uh, the Black Power Movement, the Civil Rights Movement, 
in the COINTEL pro, pro uh, the co counterintelligence program. But but this is a new phase, I think, in the um, post 9/11 world that that is focused on a different community. Um, but the way that it manifests itself, uh, the way that we hear about it is, uh, you know, often people call us and say the FBI has contacted me um, uh, and is asking about my activism. Um, uh, you know, we, we, we've heard reports from students that they found bugs in the, in the prayer room uh, at their school. Um, uh, we also know that or there's a lot of suspicion that um, there are infiltrators in student groups and other activist groups. Um, uh, we, this was revealed actually it, um, with regard to the raids of 23 anti-war activists here in Chicago and other Midwestern cities uh, in 2010. Um, they, they were, you know, it, it turned out there was an agent who was uh, uh, infiltrating their activist groups for, for years or, or many months. Um, and uh, no indictments have happened four years later uh, of these anti-war and Palestine solidarity activists, um, but, uh, but it is connected to the recent uh, indictment and now conviction of a beloved Palestinian community activist here in Chicago, Rasmi Aoudeh. Um, uh, which I, I want to talk a little more about um, because it's a very relevant case right now. Um, and I think it illustrates really the, the way that, um, uh, that the government is, um, is using prosecutions to, uh, uh, to intimidate an entire community and to intimidate activism on this issue. <clears throat> Next slide. Sorry. Um, now, criminal prosecutions. Uh, we, you know, in the in the context of activism, we usually think about them in, in the context of street protests and things like resisting arrest, et cetera. And of course, that happens. Um, uh, y you know, uh, offenses like trespass or resisting arrest. Uh, especially when there's civil disobedience happening. Um, but we've seen a number of, of really significant cases uh, that, that show that the government is going after Palestinian Americans in particular. Um, and, and the typical way that this happens is, is that they're painted as terrorists, they're painted as evil, they're painted as uh, dangerous and threatening to, to the community. Um, now, the case of Rasmi Aude, I think, is, is especially uh, uh, chilling. Um, this is a 67-year-old woman who uh, uh, you know, came to the United States 20 years ago um, and obtained her uh, citizenship 10 years ago. Um, just last fall, she was arrested. She was indicted, arrested, um, and charged with a, a unlawful procurement of naturalization. They said that she uh, lied on her 2004 naturalization application, application because she didn't indicate that she was arrested, convicted, imprisoned by Israel in 1969. Um, and her trial just happened in Detroit uh, a couple of last week. Was it only last week? Um, and, uh, and she was convicted. Um, now, the, the story is that this, this woman was, was indeed arrested, uh, convicted, and imprisoned by Israel. But the way that she was arrested, convicted, and imprisoned um, uh, was, was not allowed to be aired to the jury. The fact that, that she was uh, um, uh, arrested among 500 other people in a prisoner sweep in, uh, in the occupied territories in 1969. The fact that she was tortured for 45 days, brutally sexually uh, raped, um, and the fact that she was, that, that a confession was tortured out of her, 
um, uh, and the fact that she was convicted by an, a military court, which I think we heard, does not provide uh, what we think of as due process. Um, so during her trial, she testified, um, she was not allowed to testify about her torture, even though um, the prosecution was allowed to say what she was convicted of, which, were, which was a couple of bombings in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv in 1969, um, which, which she denies she was involved in. So, um, you know, the, the whole process of this prosecution and the trial um, and the conviction, she was immediately uh, taken to jail. This is, again, an almost 70-year-old woman who has been nothing but an asset to her community. She uh, runs a women's, a, a women's committee uh, out of the Arab American Action Network here in Chicago, organizing immigrant women. Um, so, so this whole uh, process, this whole um, uh, system has, has really shown the, uh, the bias towards, um, uh, to against uh, Palestinians in this country. Um, she was also not allowed to, to have as a witness somebody who would have testified that she suffered PTSD, that that affects the way you answer questions. Um, and, but uh, I think, you know, despite that, the, the organizing around her case continues. Um, you know, there are other big cases involving Palestinian Americans over the last decade or so, uh, often involving charges of material support for terrorism. So we've seen the Holy Land Five case. We've seen um, the, the case of Mohammed Salah here in Chicago uh, uh, and uh, Sami Al-Ariyan in, in Florida. All of these were Palestinian Americans who, um, you know, the Holy Land Five case is a charity case. Mohammed Salah's case involved him um, taking charity to the West Bank before Hamas was even designated a terrorist organization, A, to charity committees there um, that even the US government was giving money to. Um, and again, he was arrested and tortured and forced into a confession uh, in Israeli prisons. And then, you know, prosecuted when he got here, when he got home. Um, and, and has suffered miserably um, uh, since then. So, uh, you know, just to point out, I think a lot of these cases have in common um, the fact that, that Israel feeds the United States government a lot of the information for these cases. Uh, they are often the impetus behind the, these prosecutions. They send witnesses to testify in court, uh, and the courts allow them to testify anonymously um, which, if, if we all know the Sixth Amendment, uh, we would think that that, uh, that really hinders one's ability to, um, uh, to face the, your accuser. Um, it, so, uh, you know, the, the, the use of tortured confessions in U.S. courts uh, is common in these cases. Really problematic procedural issues um, that are challenged, but, but those challenges are not, uh, they're not working. <laughs> so uh, we, we're seeing the use of Israeli evidence coming from uh, uh, the Israeli government, the Israeli military, Israeli courts uh, that we know uh, do not work for Palestinians, but uh, work, uh, you know, to, to against them. Um, in the case of uh, kind of advocacy work where there aren't often uh, big prosecutions. One rare example is the case of the, the University of California, Irvine, um, a case called the, the uh, UC 11, the uh, Irvine 11, uh, where, where students from the University of California, Irvine and Riverside um, protested the speech of former Israeli Ambassador Michael Oren um, by standing up one after the other um, and yelling out during his speech uh, statements like "You're a war criminal," um, and uh, you know the the they and then they walked out. Um, they were arrested. Um, they were disciplined by their university, of course. The, the student group, the Muslim Students Union that uh, organized the protest was, was put on probation for a year. But a year later, they were prosecuted by the Orange County 
prosecutor. Uh, for what? For disrupting a public meeting, which is kind of an obscure California statute, rarely used, um, and, and, and certainly not uh, uh, for, for these kinds of protests, which are very common. Uh, you know, we see people heckling Obama's speeches all the time uh, without any consequence, and, and there are numerous examples uh, of other similar protests happening without any consequence. Um, you know, in that case, the Orange County Prosecutor's Office put enormous amounts of resources into this case. They put their top prosecutors on it. You know, college students uh, uh, making their voices heard. And, and the way that the, 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 the charge was uh, portrayed, and it's the same with Rasmia's case, it, you know, they, they peppered in things about, um, oh, and they, they, they went to pray before they, they did their protest and uh, you know characterizing trying to bring out the fact that they're Muslim and, and the fact that they're maybe pious the fact that um, uh, that they support Palestinian rights to somehow uh, put them in a bad light um, so so those are some examples of criminal prosecutions that are happening uh, against uh, Palestinians Palestinian rights activists but the real burden falls on, uh, on Palestinians in this country um, uh, who, who are easier to, to vilify. Um. <clears throat> uh, I'm gonna switch over to the world of college campuses for a bit. Um, as I said, this has been the real uh, focus of, of activism uh, in this country in these, year, in these past years. Um, uh, and uh, you know we're we're seeing all kinds of very creative, uh, uh, active um, activities happening on campuses that are trying to bring awareness, uh, educate uh, folks about what uh, what it's like to be Palestinian, what the Palestinian, uh, 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 what Palestinian life is like, etc. So mock checkpoints, uh, illustrating what it's like to uh, be a Palestinian and, and go from village to village in the West Bank. Um, uh, apartheid walls that illustrate what it's like to have a wall coat going through your land. Um, uh, mock eviction notices um, showing the, the Israeli policy of, of evictions and home demolitions. Um, so, and of course, uh, boycott, divestment, and sanctions campaigns trying to get their universities to divest from um, pr um, companies that profit from the, the Israeli occupation. Um, so, uh, you know, one big trend that we're seeing is that students, even professors, um, people in the community who are perceived to support Palestinian rights are, are treated differently. And that's what despair, as lawyers in the room will know, that's what disparate treatment means. It's a, a differential treatment, unequal treatment. Um, and it's, it's often, we think, because of their views. And as we know, the First Amendment doesn't allow discrimination based on viewpoint. Um, of course, we're dealing with private universities as well as public universities. So the level of First Amendment protections varies from university to university. But um, even in, in, in the application of rules and, and other uh, treatment by administrations, we're seeing a, a disproportionate um, targeting and condemnation and discipline of, uh, of Palestinian activists in particular. And this um, really manifests itself in a couple of ways. Administrative harassment sounds kind of boring, sounds kind of uh, benign, um, but it, it's, really, um, it's really nefarious. Um, and, and it's really harmful. The effect that it has uh, is, is very chilling to, to student speech especially. Um, and what happens is just that universities are making it really difficult for students to organize, to hold events, um, to invite speakers. Uh, um, and, and they do this in various ways. So, um, you know, they, they say that rooms aren't available when they really are. Um, they, you know, require uh, student groups to 
have RSVPs if they want people from outside campus to come. Um, in the CUNY system, we're seeing a lot of these kinds of problems of uh, you know, uh, really lengthy delays that other student groups are not facing. Um, so you know, they, can't, they can't publicize an event until they get it approved, and they're not getting it approved uh, until a day before, right? Um, so these are all ways to, to, um, uh, to hinder the, the activities of, of uh, Students for Justice in Palestine and other student groups. Um, their uh, administrations are often um, are often imposing security fees on uh, student events. Uh, uh, this happened at Brooklyn College after I don't know if you all know about the situation um, in 2013 when students organized an event on BDS. Uh, inviting Omar Barghouti and Judith Butler. There was a huge uproar. Um, New York City politicians were uh, uh, harassing the university, saying they have to cancel the event, um, threatening to withdraw uh, uh, public funding from the university if this event was allowed to happen. Um, so it created more attention for the event, and it ended up being a packed event. But, uh, after the case, um, the, the university imposed a, a new security fee requirement and um, uh, requirements for handling RSVPs from outside, which really disproportionately affect SJP and which seem to only have been applied so far to SJP. Um, and PSLS challenged this with, with CUNY and they've now withdrawn the security fee at Brooklyn College specifically They've re withdrawn the security fee requirement. Um, so, you know, I think it, it is important to push back on these things. Of course, um, you know, when security fees are, are employed in a way that is based on, uh, that, that is based on the viewpoint that is being expressed, um, then, then it's unconstitutional. And, um, and, and that's what we argued in, in that case. You know, we, we've had students calling us and say, my administration is telling me we can't use the, the, uh, the name Students for Justice in Palestine, which is a, now a widespread student group around the country. Um, uh, you know, this recalls kind of the, uh, a case from the 1970s, Healy versus James, where uh, the Supreme Court said, that's unconstitutional, you can't. Um, it, you can't refuse to recognize an SDS chapter back in the day um, uh, without, you know, a real, a, a real reason to, to do so. Um, so. So these are the kinds of, this is the kind of um, uh, administrative harassment that we're seeing all over the country. Again, these are, these don't seem like really big cases. It's not that, might not seem like a big deal. Um, but when you see it happening again and again, and you uh, think about the cumulative effect, effect this has on students' ability to organize, uh, I think it becomes much more significant. And, um, and you know, it's happening because of uh, extensive pressure from outside groups often complaining about events, complaining about the, the activities of these student groups, and forcing the university to do something about it. And they want their, you know, it's, it's relentless, the pressure that universities face to, to, to do something. The, um, the second way that disparate treatment uh, manifests itself is, is just through an outright uh, different application of the rules. And, um, I'm sure many of you know about the case of Professor Steven Salaita at the University of Illinois, um, who was uh, terminated after tweeting about Gaza this summer. He hadn't even gotten to U University of Illinois, but his appointment, you know, uh, what had been, you know, finalized as far as he knew, um, and he was getting ready to move. He had resigned from his previous position, was moving his family, etc. Um, and the the. University said, oh, it hasn't gone to the Board of Trustees yet. Um, we're not uh, going to approve his appointment after, you know, when, when this is usually a rubber stamp 
um, uh, for, for appointments and often doesn't happen until two months into the semester when the person is already there, et cetera. Um, so, so this case is now uh, alive and well and has resulted in a huge um, outpouring of support and boycotts of the University of Illinois, et cetera. Um, but I think that's one example. Another is uh, that of Northeastern where students were, uh, after they, they did a mock eviction action, which I, I, I described earlier, uh, putting flyers under dorm room doors saying, you know, with a flyer, let me show you the flyer, um, uh, saying, you know, you've been evicted and then, you know, it, it has on the bottom, this is not a real eviction notice and it has some information about uh, uh, home, uh, Palestinian home demolitions and evictions. Um, after they did this action, they were immediately suspended by the university. And this was after a year of intense pressure by a very wealthy donor who happens to also be affiliated, affiliated with the Zionist Organization of America, which was pressuring the university, threatening um, uh, civil rights complaints, which I'll talk a little bit about later, um, uh, et cetera. So, so they were suspended, um, even though, again, going to the disparate treatment issue, even though a lot of students throw um, flyers under dorm room doors, right? So, so when, um, when uh, even if these activities may have been a violation of the rules technically, if they're not applied equally to everybody, that's a, a, a legal issue. Um, what happened in, at Loyola here in Chicago, uh, you all may have heard about the students who um, lined up at a birthright Israel table to um, try to register for a program that provides free trips to only Jewish students to go to Israel. And they wanted to line up as Palestinians mostly to say that uh, I want to go on a trip. Uh, it's my birthright. It's, it, it, you know, my family is from this village that was destroyed, et cetera. Um, and, uh, you know, they lined up peacefully. They were asking, can I register? And, uh, you know, almost immediately, students complained to the administration, said they were being harassed, said that uh, there, there, there were racial or ethnic slurs being used against them. All, all false, and, uh, you know, they had video to showing how, how calm and peaceful it was, um, and, and saying that they violated uh, university rules. Um, uh, so the, 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 after a month-long investigation, the students were charged by the university with six disciplinary violations, including bias-motivated misconduct and uh, failure to register a demonstration. Mind you, they had heard about this the night before and decided to do it you know, within 12 hours of the actual thing. Um, so there would have been no time to abide by the seven-day or 14-day notice that the university requires. Um, uh, and, uh, and several other charges. They were found not responsible for five out of those six, responsible for not registering their demonstration. Um, Hillel, which was doing the tabling, was also found not responsible for, uh, or found responsible, sorry, for violating uh, the same, uh, a similar uh, policy because they did not register their tabling event. Um, the punishment, however, was uh, vastly unequal. The, the SJP group um, uh, is now on probation for the whole year, which means that they can no longer get funding, um, and uh, you know their ability to organize is seriously curtailed, and they have to attend an intergroup t training. Uh, Hillel just has to go to a meeting to uh, learn more about the rules about registering their events. So I think that's a clear example of uh, disparate treatment. Get through this, uh, the rest quickly, so um, in case you all have questions. Um, changing the rules, we see this all the time. I explained the Brooklyn College situation where after this big hubbub over the BDS event, uh, they changed all kinds of rules. It also happened at <clears throat> Barnard College in, in uh, New York where students put up a banner uh, uh, um, advertising Israel Apartheid Week, and uh, it was a banner approved by the university, hung up by the university in a place where these kinds of banners are often hung. 
um, uh, Hillel students there complained immediately and the same night it was taken down by the university without explanation, without notice, without anything. And uh, thereafter, the university said, we're not letting anybody hang any banners anymore. Um, this is, you know, uh, there, it, there shouldn't be political material up there, even though there have been political posters uh, for many years. Um, so rules are being changed in order to uh, curtail the activities uh, of these activists. Inciting law enforcement investigations, um, this really relates to the frequency with which um, these Israel advocacy groups are reporting student activists to law enforcement. They are um, uh, you know, saying publicly that, oh, we're, we're, we're telling the, the FBI about the Muslim Students Union or whatever. Because of their speech activities. We're not talking about any real evidence of anything. Um, it's, it's because of their speech activities. And um, you know, we're, we're seeing student groups being interrogated by campus police. That happened at Northeastern. Um, false accusations of terrorism are very common as well. Whenever a student group has a fundraiser for Gaza or for, uh, uh, or for another uh, charity, um, they're often accused of, uh, the, the university is told, oh, this is probably material support for terrorism. You shouldn't let it happen. And inevitably, the university says, oh, well, in that case, let's, uh, you, know, you have to choose between these two charities or whatever the case. Um, and, and there are reports out that, you know, that SJP is connected to Hamas. And all of these things are really, again, meant to intimidate, meant to uh, bring law enforcement attention to these student activists that are you know, engaged in entirely peaceful uh, and uh, um, uh, protected activities. So it's really chilling and it's um, really uh, um, inflammatory and, and nefarious, I think. Cyberbullying, I think, you know, uh, we, we are hearing many reports of students getting really vile, racist, uh, misogynistic, um, hateful messages uh, uh, online. And I'm sure CARE <laughs> has many examples of this kind of thing. Uh, but these are directly related to uh, students' Palestine activism and directly related to, um, uh, uh, to their Palestinian heritage or their, their um, religion or whatever the case. Um, lawsuits, um, I'm running out of time here, but I, this is probably the most important <laughs> part. Um, we, uh, one of the major tactics that Israel advocacy groups have used is the use of uh, the Civil Rights Act, uh, the Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, which prohibits discrimination based on race, color, national origin by institutions of higher education. And they use these uh, complaints under this uh, statute to say that universities are allowing a hostile environment for Jewish students by tolerating all of this Palestine activism. Um, so they're claiming discrimination uh, against uh, Jewish students who support Israel specifically because there are many Jewish students, of course, who uh, are active uh, with SJPs and other groups. Um, uh, so, so they're saying that there, there is a hostile environment for Jewish students on campuses. And we've seen four of these cases dismissed so far. And the Department of Education, which investigates them, has said, you know, this is almost entirely First Amendment protected act activity that's being complained about. Um, this is a university, and students should expect uh, a level of discomfort, a level of, uh, of challenge to their ideas. They, um, so, so those are really important dismissals. But we're seeing all over the place, still, despite these dismissals, um, these allegations of hostile environment, of threatening uh, behavior by, by uh, students uh, working for Palestinian rights. Um, uh, so so this, this language um, is, is still very much in use. And these threats of the threat of um, Title VI complaints is, is used often. Um, and, and that also has a real chilling effect um, uh, because it, it, you know, universities 
respond to these threats by, again, doing what, what I described before, the administrative har harassment and whatnot. Um, so there are other lawsuits that uh, I, I can't really talk about, but you know, after the American Studies Association passed a bo an academic boycott resolution last year, they were threatened with a lawsuit. Um, um, you know, the Olympia Food Co-op was, was sued for, for passing, uh, for boycotting Israeli goods. Um, so, so those kinds of lawsuits, especially against BDS campaigns, um, are, are, I think, going to be more and more common. Legislation, um, uh, the, I think the last point I want to make, legislation is also a, a tactic that is being used after, again, the same ASA academic resolution, boycott resolution last year, six states and the US Congress tried to pass legislation that would defund universities um, where uh, y y that paid for their faculties, uh, associate membership dues or uh, uh, associational activities with um, you know, organizations like the ASA that promote or, or endorse boycott. Um, and you know, with, with a coalition here in Illinois, we managed to defeat the Illinois legislation. Same happened in New York. Um, the US congressional legislation didn't go anywhere. But you know, it's clear that there are these efforts to, um, uh, to uh, silence and stop and intimidate um, uh, these kinds of uh, efforts to, to bring some accountability somewhere on all levels um, uh, of, of the government as well as um, elsewhere. Um, so I'll stop there and um, just uh, so you know, this, that's our contact information. And sorry if I didn't leave much time for questions, but I'm happy to answer any. Students, at the student activists feel tension. Um, tension between, you know, voicing their positions and being active in organizations like SJP versus the possible repercussions that they can face in terms of future career prospects, their education, and so on. For example, University of California Berkeley, when they're trying to pass their divestment and sanctions to the student senate. APAC, the Israeli lobby, would fly in their lobbyists and meet with these senators and intimidate them, saying you're going to be blacklisted from graduate um, careers and you're never going to get anywhere. And I think that's even more so in graduate institutions like law school, um, where a lot of these institutions are funded by donors who are active in Zionist organizations, so on and so forth. So where do you recommend student activists find that balance? Is there a balance? Um, do you take that chance and be completely active with the risk of facing such heavy consequences? Um, what do you think? Yeah, I, well, I, I don't know if I can answer that question per se. I think it's a personal decision for everybody, but I, I think what you described really attests to the chilling effect that this um, this repression has when you have to choose between speaking out about something that you you, you know you feel strongly about and uh, you know having a clean uh, a, a Google search uh, um, it, it, it's a problem um, uh, you know we students we come across students all the time who say I don't want to put my name there even if they're active with their SJP I don't want to put my name on this op-ed that I wrote. I don't want to publicly testify at my divestment hearing. Um, uh, you know, I'm not going to go to a protest. It's the same with, uh, you know, undocumented students or immigrant, um, you know, people with student visas. They're scared that that something will happen uh, to their status. Um, so, so it's a real problem, and I, I think you're right. It, it especially affects uh, people in the graduate level. We hear all the time students saying that my professor told me. Don't, don't do this, it's not worth it, it's gonna ruin your career, you'll never be able to get a job. Um, uh, so, you know, what I will say is that, um, you know, more and more we're seeing students who say, I don't care, um, and I, this is more important to me 
and I will find a job. <laughs> and they often do, you know? I mean, these things tend to pass. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, our purpose, PSLS's purpose, is really to, um, uh, to let people know that, that they will have support uh, if they do choose to, to speak out. And, um, you know, we will work along with our, our, our many partners to, to make sure that they're not, um, uh, you know, thrown under the bus for, for making that decision. But, but it's a difficult one, and I can't, um, you know, I think it's, it's a very personal one. A nice collect, uh, connection. We wanted to make sure, as you know, Military Court Watch was here to help us kick off the campaign, No Way to Treat a Child. But we recognize that asking people to speak up and become involved in issues. Um, someone asked earlier, how can we put the spotlight on, on, on the conditions of children in military detention? That, that becomes a way of using free speech that makes us, or may make us, as, as the young gentleman said, vulnerable to attack, and so that's why we wanted to make sure you heard from Dima Khalidi of Palestine Legal Support. Again, uh, if you want information, we have at our information table uh, about Military Court Watch, and um, we'll just stay for just a few more minutes to make sure people have a chance to look at the, uh, the uh, pamphlets and reports that we have available. Thank you.